we are going to cover three topics. The goal is to move through those uh, and absolutely have time for questions and conversation. Um, I will say now to make sure I remember, uh, after, once we make it through this, and if you need to leave at any point, I very much encourage you uh, to stop by our friend Jane King and that desk. Jane is a member of the Culture Task Force. Are you going to display? We're like a TV show now. Hold it up. Oh, yes. Uh, the, we have these fantastic CCRI green pennants. I'm no banner. <laughs> <laughs> and our guiding principles are on uh, buttons, separate buttons inside. And the request is take it back to your team, to your area, to your department. And when you observe one of your teammates living one of these principles, please um, share that with that individual and add it to the pennant. Uh, it, there are many creative ways to do this. If you come up with um, even more creative ways, please have at it. But the goal is to really get these across the college and get people really talking about the guiding principles. I'm going to walk us through um, just a small handful, six or seven slides, to talk to, to this room, really, about academic and career paths. Uh, Sarah is going to walk us through a conversation on enrollment where we are right now, where we're looking to go in the spring and beyond. And then Alix will talk to us about our facilities, our four campuses, and the master plan that has really the ink is still drawing on it, and what we're looking to do right now and over the next several years. So that's the plan, and I'll just uh, jump in right now. Uh, Andrew Lee, I'm looking at Andrew. Uh, raise your hand if you know Andrew Lee. Uh, my guess is no Andrew, <laughs> half the room. Uh, <laughs> He is a remarkable, uh, a remarkable CCRI student. He'll be graduating this spring. Uh, he is president of the Knight Campus Student Government. Uh, he epitomizes a go-getter. I, I if I walk out of my office, um, more often than not, I find Andrew doing something. Uh, uh, both inside and outside of the classroom, he just embodies, I think, what our students can do. Uh, if we can create a path for them. So I hope many of you saw the New York Times uh, article that was about a number of, covered a number of colleges, but it did cover the very early stage partnership that we're building with Brown, and uh, Andrew was the student that uh, the New York Times profiled. So he's, uh, I think, a very good reminder of uh, why I know every single one of us does what we do. Uh, so with that, particularly when I look at this room, we have folks that have been with us for decades and we have folks that have been with us for two years or less. So particularly for the folks that are our newest arrivals, I want to go all the way back to, so why did we decide to do this work anyway? What, what was it that led us to say, among all the things we might prioritize, why have we chosen this? And when I think about that, sort of the origin story, it's really because from the very first day I arrived, which is now nearly four years ago, what I heard, I heard from faculty, I have heard from advisors and counselors, I heard from folks in financial aid, this need to coordinate in an even more integrated fashion the way we approach supporting our students through this place to a certificate degree and beyond. And it's really just that simple. It was from across the college, this strong sense that we've got the people, We've got the motivation, we've got the desire, we've got the tools and the technology and the capacity. We need a framework. And more than anything else, um, I think what the launching of this uh, career and academic path represents is it's a framework to do the work in an even more coordinated fashion beyond what the college has been doing for decades. So I, I would really take us back to that moment. And we made a decision, and that decision was we are going to join the movement across the country of colleges that are really committing to this concept of academic and career paths. And to do that, we brought in Rob Johnstone, who has spent his entire career in the higher education space, to help work with us to think about what's it going to look like to do it here at the college? What does it look like to do at CCRI? And so Rob came in about two and a half years ago, the fall of 2017. Uh, there was a task force of faculty and student services people. They came together and worked for close to two years 
to really begin to um, draft and design what is our version going to look like. And so that gets us, I think, to where we are this fall and where we are looking to go um, both the end of this year into the spring and, and beyond. Uh, I want to take us all back. I, was it, no, it is a blur. Was it November that we had the big enrollment afternoon and evening at night? Yes. November? Yes. So I went, this, let's call it a month ago. It was right before Thanksgiving. And I went into the Great Hall, of one of my, honestly, my favorite spaces in Rhode Island. Forget about CCRI. And it was packed. It was packed with faculty. It was packed with student services people. It was packed with students. Uh, students still in high school that are about to come here who were coming often with their parents, uh, older students coming with spouses or partners or children, and really, I mean, it was hundreds and hundreds of people. And right in the middle of that enormous space was this circular table, set of tables with the seven pathways. And behind those, path, behind those tables were faculty advisors and in many cases, students who are in the program. So to, to the example that comes immediately to mind, in the, the healthcare path, there was a current nursing student there, along with our deans and some faculty members. And so I, it just struck me so powerfully of the difference it makes, even in these early days, to have some structure uh, particularly for new students. I think it will have value for our students through their entire journey with us, but when you're walking into any of our four campuses, to have something that can frame your experience of the college from the minute you arrive, I can tell you it feels different. And I hear from students, they are experiencing their onboarding, their arrival here in a way that sounds different than it did to me four years ago. It was really powerful. I went up to the fourth floor later that evening for a poetry reading. So Charles Kell is a new English professor here. He had a poetry reading that was remarkable. And I got to look down at the Great Hall. And it was even more powerful there just visually what this is all about. So um, for all of you who weren't there, I hope I described kind of what it looks like uh, when it actually takes shape. So what what is it and, and what were we, what was the unmet need that this idea is setting out to address? I think the first is we know that students do better if they can design a plan when they first arrive at the college. So that sounds so simple, but it's all the New Year's resolutions we're gonna make about what we're gonna commit to in 2020. Whatever that is, I'm gonna exercise more saying that and converting it to a plan of whatever it is. I'm gonna exercise for 20 minutes a day, five days a week. It's a similar concept of if we can get them right when they arrive and work to orient them and set them up with a plan, we know that the likelihood of them staying, of them persisting, of them doing well in their classes and persisting to graduation and on to transfer and employment um, goes up. Second, uh, getting them a clear roadmap of the actual, what does it look like? What is the series of classes that a student can think about pursuing here in order to move from a brand new college student to a certificate earning or degree earning student? So again, uh, having a sense of what actually are the steps along that path that I will need to take in order to hit the graduation stage in a timely fashion. And then finally, and this is everyone in this room, everyone in this room, the guidance and support all college students need to stay on track. So it's really, it's that concept at its most elemental. And uh, what, what else do we know? Uh, we know that it, what, the story broke yesterday morning and we're covered today in Ed Dive that we were recognized as the two-year college of the year. There are 1,200 community colleges in the United States. Um, yes, we should clap. That is what CCRI <laughs> was recognized for doing. And I, I share it at this point um, for the following reason. I, I don't actually think that we're the strongest community in America yet. I think what this award recognizes is the amount of progress that this college has made over the last several years is remarkable. And that, I think, is what we're building upon. And the Guided Pathways part of this work was central, I think, to the award being given to the college. 
So I, I, I make that acknowledgement because I think about how did we get to this idea, right? I said it started with listening to faculty and folks in student services. It also then was looking around the United States and saying when we look at community colleges that are enrolling students, that are holding on to them, and that are graduating them effectively, what are those colleges doing? And again and again and again, what we were seeing is they are really invested in this pathways work. And you can look across the country. You can look at Lorain County Community College in Ohio, check the box. Wake Technical in Wisconsin, check the box. Austin in Texas, check the box. And many others who I think we can look to for how they have baked in, it into their work for nearly 10 years. Those schools that are doing that are producing graduates who are graduating in a far more timely fashion, so 50% fewer excess credits and significantly more transferable credits. So I wanna pause there and think about that. If you work in student services and part of your role is to think about how we really support our students to and through, how do we ensure they get an outstanding education here and they get what they need but not a lot more than what they need. We want to get them into their four, into one of our four-year partners or into that first-year career. It matters when our students take additional classes and classes that don't transfer. Why? We're all nodding our heads. It takes their time, so there's an opportunity cost, and it takes their money, whether it's their own money out of their pocket or it's federal financial aid or loans. That, that, that's why it matters so much that we work with this kind of intention to make sure that our students have a clear path to make their way through. Okay, so let us listen to some of the members of the CCRI community about what Guided Pathways looks like in action. It's a roadmap. It's all about ensuring student success. This is the GPS for students. It's going to be of great benefit to our students. I think that historically most of our students have come in, they know they want to get an associate's degree or certificate, they know they want to transfer, they may know the institution, but finding their way there amid roughly 100 degree and certificate offerings can be daunting and confusing. What used to happen before is that the student comes in, looks at the, the, the catalog, and chooses a major haphazardly. So after one year, a year and a half, they're like, Oh my God, I just wasted my time. Even for those students who um, see it through all the way to graduation, often they may graduate with excess courses, which they really did not need in order to graduate or even transfer to a four-year school. And CCRI now has a wonderful set of seven paths for students to choose from that align with our majors. And it will help them here while they're at CCRI, and it will help them go on further as they decide to get jobs or transfer to other colleges. So the student can easily identify if they go full-time, how long it will take them. If they want to go part-time, they have a guide as to what courses they should be taking. There's a, a sense that those students want more structure, want more direction, want more clarity, and I think Guided Pathways will bring that for our students. Everyday advising is about getting students where they need to be, and that is being efficient and effective in our advising sessions with students, telling them why they're taking classes, where it's going to transfer, and having guided pathways. We're able to advise students on the academic path that leads to their career. Perfect, so let's take a look at what the seven paths are. We've got arts and humanities, business economics and data analytics, communication, media and design, education, government and human services, environment and sustainability, health and health administration, and science, technology, engineering and math. Uh, when I look at those and I then reflect on what we know to be true about economic development more broadly in Rhode Island, when we look at the Brookings Report <coughs> and its first release, when we look at what Bruce Katz is about to release, I look at these paths and we are right where we want to be in terms of producing graduates who will be in demand for quality careers. So I'm encouraged with what the task force came up with and I'm excited to see how we uh, increasingly connect with the employment space. Okay, so with the paths, um, our students get a clear understanding of the different programs in each path, uh, course sequences that allow students to explore but staying on track to graduation. 
they get an understanding of what certificates are available within the, de within the paths and the degrees. Uh, they understand what a transfer path to our four-year partner institutions can look like and what the sequence of, of coursework will look like in order to do that effectively. Um, they get to begin to understand potential careers, right? What if I choose one of these paths? What are the options for the careers I can have once I've completed this, once I've gone on to a four-year degree? And with that, I think critically, is the labor market data about those choices. You know, I think increasingly, uh, when we look across America and we look at the burden that the expense of being a college tuition, of being a college student places on the students themselves and their families, I think being really authentic about the need for this to produce a labor market outcome matters. So again, from the very beginning, first day, you're arriving, you're getting to know the college, all the way through to where you're envisioning what your first career can look like, having an understanding about the choices that you make and how that will then impact your future, I think is really important and I'm proud of the college for being intentional with how we talk to our students about that work. So when we look around the country um, for how this idea is working at other colleges, um, we can learn a lot and I reference some of the schools that have been at it for just about 10 years. Um, what do we know? We know that the work is really led by our faculty. Our faculty are in the classroom every single day with our students. And in those classrooms, anyone who's been a teacher, look at Javier, you're a teacher, you know that your role goes well beyond simply teaching English as a second language, right? You're a coach, you're advisor, you're a mentor, you're, depending on the student, all of us, right, are providing a variety of roles. So when our, when our faculty are in the classroom, I think providing our faculty with the tools that they want in order to be able to really effectively support the navigation of these paths is going to be important. We also know, I see a lot of members of our student services team, uh, it's, it's all of you who are admitting our students, enrolling our students, figuring out how they are going to actually make this college affordable for them, advising and counseling so that they can make their way through. Again. All, all of this work has been done well for decades here. I think what this offers is an opportunity to do it in an even more intentionally integrated way. Where are we going next? Uh, I think almost everyone in the room knows that we were awarded our first ever Title III grant. That's a landmark for CCRI and I really want to thank the folks that were involved with that grant. Um, many of you know Sandy Sneesby. She worked closely with Rosemary Costigan who's arrived and a team of folks to submit a grant that was successful. Um, that's groundbreaking for CCRI and we intend to be very effective in our utilization of this grant and to continue to submit uh, successful proposals to continue to receive Title III grants. Um, very simply, the grant is going to focus on three parts of this Pathways work. First of all, I think again, more than once uh, in this conversation, I've talked about that idea of integrating even more intentionally so much of the work that's already going on. So really focusing on how do we do that in a deliberate way. What we, when we look around at what other colleges have done, they've designed a role called a path navigator. And it's exactly what it sounds like, right? It is someone who knows that particular path through and through and can help think about coordinating the work that goes on that we have very well represented even just in this room. Um, so that's an early stage idea. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, once we hire a grant advisor, which I am hopeful will be early, very, very soon, <laughs> at the very early part of January or 2020, um, to bring that work together for us. I think uh, the next thing, it, and again, I think about, I heard this probably my first week here from faculty and from folks in advising and counseling, which is for brand new students, how do we think about a, a course, an actual course, to welcome and orient our students to the Community College of Rhode Island? Um, lots of colleges have them. Uh, I think just down the road at the University of Rhode Island, they have launched one of these first year experience courses to great success. We know it's going to help with retention, helping our students understand how to navigate what is a complex and multi-campus environment will increase the likelihood that they can stay with us, they can learn effectively, and they can go on to graduate. Uh, 
And then finally, uh, a project-based experiential learning uh, part of their coursework while they're with us. Increasingly, when we're talking to our four-year partners, when we're talking to our potential employer partners, they're saying, we want to know that your graduates are coming out of your college with real-life work experience, right? So I think it is very much early, very early stages what that will look like here. But we know that if we can think about designing some kind of capstone experience, we believe that will make our students uh, more competitive as transfer students to the four-year space and into the labor market. So very uh, high level, you know, I would, I would select those three priorities as our early stage priorities. We're excited um, to get going. Uh, I'm very excited to see what we're able to do in 2020. And I'll just close by saying, you know, how are we going to measure our success? And I, again, when I walk around the college, um, what I hear from faculty and from folks in student services, what are our faculty and, and the, the staff in student services most focused on? Are our students learning effectively? Are they actually having a strong learning experience at the college? Are they able to acquire the knowledge and the skills that they need in order to get on to the next stage of our life? When I think about it, it's just this. Success is going to look like even stronger learning outcomes than what we already have today. Um, I think we are going to see our students graduate at an even higher rate than they are right now, transfer even more successfully than they are right now, and launch new careers even more successfully than they are right now. And we'll be looking at that uh, to see that we are really marking our progress. And so I'm just going to close um, by saying uh, I am really grateful to, for everybody who has been part of this work from the very beginning. You know, it has been a college-wide planning effort. It will need to continue to be for it to be successful. When I, again, when I think about this work, I think it is simply a structure that we will define together that will work for this college, this institution, and our, uh, and our students. Um, I'm really proud uh, of just how far the college has come in a very short period of time. And I think the, the progress that this Pathways work represents um, is just one more indication of the talent that is here in this room and all across the college. So I really appreciate you guys coming out, particularly on a busy, busy uh, Tuesday and a busy time of year. I'm happy to take questions. I've got Rosemary here also. Uh, happy to take questions about Pathways now. Uh, also, of course, happy to take them at the end of, of this conversation. So anybody have a question? If something comes, we're here. And, and we'd be happy to come back at it. So thanks, thanks everybody. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah, who will talk to us about enrollment and where we are. Excellent, hi everyone. So I'm gonna talk about enrollment, and I think some of you have already heard big chunks of this before. I will also say, I don't think we can hear it enough or talk about it enough, because it matters. And I think that in, I read a lot of higher ed stuff every morning that comes to the top of my inbox and you read about enrollment, enrollment, enrollment. And I think sometimes when you talk about something a lot or read about something a lot, you risk losing sight of why it matters. And so I think if there's one thing I would start with, with why does enrollment matter to CCRI? Well, this, this, is the, this is exactly what we are here to do as an institution. It is why we exist. We exist to open these doors as widely as we possibly can for the state of Rhode Island to have a shot at higher education. That is what we do, and we do it in a way that no other institution does. There is not another open access higher education institution in the state of Rhode Island. There is not another institute of higher education in this state that is as affordable as the Community College of Rhode Island. So I think it's hard to even convey just how much this matters to the health and existence of this institution and for every single person who walks through our doors. So yes, we can talk about enrollment as percentages and numbers and statistics, and I'll do plenty of that. I do a lot of that every day too, but I think it's really important and, and should never be lost on any one of us why it matters. 
because every one number in the thousands of students we serve is someone who has made a decision amid a busy life to take their time to come to this place to believe that we are going to put forth an opportunity for them to advance their lives to a four-year institution, to a career, to something that really matters. So with that, um, I want to do a little bit of just sort of what's the context in higher ed with respect to enrollment? Where are we? Why is it actually something that's at the top of every higher ed uh, piece that I read every morning? Um, right now, it's because it's a fairly bleak environment and a complicated, rapidly changing environment. So right now, locally and nationally, community college enrollments are dropping, and fairly precipitously in some cases. There are a few drivers to that. One is that the high school population is declining. That's not a huge driver in the here and now in Rhode Island, but it is coming, um, and, and it is real. The second one, which is big and very real in our state right now, is that the labor market is pretty strong. Right? You talk about opportunity cost. If you can be out there working more hours per week, you might not feel the same need to pursue higher education. You might not have the same time in your life to be able to pursue higher education. So like many community colleges, our enrollment is to some degree inversely related to the robustness of the labor market. And um, good news for the state of Rhode Island is that we have the strongest labor market that we have seen in many years. Um, so declining high school population, uh, strong and robust labor market. And then the third piece is higher education is suddenly <coughs> extremely dynamic and extremely competitive. Right? Southern New Hampshire University has gone from a tiny place up in some city that I don't even remember, Manchester maybe, with a couple thousand students 10 years ago, and they have 130,000 students now. 130,000. Well, where did the other 128,000 people come from? Not from their tiny corner in New Hampshire. <laughs> they came from all over the place, and that continues. You'll hear ads for ASU online on the radio. You'll see boot camps. You'll see different opportunities to get micro-credentials. You'll see edX is out there showing the entire world how they can get the same courses that MIT offers, just pursuing them online. So you name it, there are 100 different variants that five years ago didn't exist, 10 years ago didn't exist, and that is only ramping up by the minute. So I think if you are an adult learner, you're looking at a whole lot of different options when you decide, hey, now's the time that I'm ready to go back uh, and pursue an education. So I share this, I think, because it's really important for us to understand the context um, in which we sit. I don't share it to scare anyone because the good news is we are actually well positioned as a college right now. So we have been subject to declining enrollment for many years. And if you look at what's going on right now, we're doing well. We had our first uptick in headcount enrollment this fall uh, since the fall of 2011. I know it's a tiny uptick, 1.6%. Uh, it's nothing to jump in, up and down about, but I think amid the context that is very real locally and nationally, it is something to be proud of, and I think it's a sign that what we are doing is working. Um, students are feeling like they walk into that great hall, they show up for that enrollment night, and this is a CCRI that they want to be a part of. Um, and make no mistake about it, I mean, it, CCRI, and I think this is the piece for us to think about deliberately after we've had more sleep, when we get quiet moments, when you have a little downtime, is really just how much every touch matters. If you think about your own college experience, your kids' school experience, you name it, whatever, some analog, and you put yourself in those shoes, college is extremely difficult. Right? What do I remember most? Yeah, now, I guess decades later, I remember fun things and the friendships I built and wonderful things that were associated with my college experience. What do I actually remember if forced to really put myself in those shoes of, of your first year of college? I remember it ex felt excruciatingly difficult. Um, and you feel like you're trying to move forward against all odds. Now, I wasn't raising a family at the time. I wasn't working that many hours a week. I had stable housing. I had food to eat every day. And um, things were relatively easy compared to what a lot of our students are facing on a daily basis. So if we think about that, 
Um, I think where do we come into play as a team? It's keeping everyone here, right? What is enrollment? What is it that makes that line tick up? Uh, yes, it's new students. Yes, it's putting on a great enrollment day and getting everyone in the great hall and making them feel like this is a place that they want to be. But we all know we've been connected to institutions that we want to remain a part of and institutions that we don't. And the make it or break it in that is what is the engagement you have with every person you encounter? And we know that being in the classroom is going to be hard. That's the nature of it. So if we, in everything outside of that classroom experience that is built to be challenging, if we can demonstrate uh, at the help desk, in financial aid, when you're with an advisor and counselor, every single moment, when you're just walking down the hall and someone passes you by, if we can demonstrate this is a place where you are welcome, we are happy to have you here, we know you're working your tail off in the classroom and we want to see you succeed, if we are closing our eyes and thinking about the actions that we as a faculty and staff can take to create that feeling in this place every day for every student, they're gonna to wanna to come back. We're gonna see a line that keeps going up. Um, and sometimes that's gonna be harder than I make it sound when we're all sitting in this you know, nice cozy room uh, thinking about the holidays and uh, vacations and the good things that lie ahead, right? I think uh, I started my day this morning taking my somewhat anxious 11 year old to the lab and the doctor for some blood work and her annual physical. So by the end of it, it was uh, a blood draw, finger prick, and four shots. Uh, whatever, you give me a blood draw, finger prick, and four shots, and I probably just sort of soldier through it at this point in my life. But for my already pretty anxious, for whatever reason, afraid of all things medical, 11-year-olds, uh, let's just say it wasn't her best behavior. So um, there was a lot of screaming. There was a lot of crying. Um, it was not a good scene. We're going to go back to that pediatrician because despite my child's worst behavior, they were really great. They dealt with the screaming. They had clearly seen it before. They understood that what we're here to do is deliver health care. And like, look, some of this behavior is just at the fringes. And our job is to both get the job done and somehow still make this as pleasant as it can possibly be. Uh, and I share that story because I think that in the same way that four shots feels incredibly high stakes and nerve wracking to an 11 year old, uh, if you're 19 and you maybe didn't have the best high school experience and nobody in your family has gone to college and you're trying to figure out how to fit this in when you don't really have an easy way to get here every day because the rip that takes you two hours and even the walk to the bus stop, which no one's thinking about is 17 minutes. Or if you're a 35 year old um, and you're afraid to admit that like you already struggle to help your third and fourth grader with their math homework and now you're going to commit to coming back to this place where you got to face the stuff you haven't seen in 20 years that you never liked or felt comfortable with in the first place. Yeah, there are going to be moments where because you're struggling with fractions in the classroom and that's like making your blood pressure rise that maybe you're going to get to the bursar's office and you're actually not going to display your best behavior. Um, th that's our reality. So I think I share that because if we're going to retain students, look, it's easy to retain. Like, Lin Linda's going to be really pleasant, really positive, and I'm never going to struggle to say hello to Linda in the hall. Um, and we're going to have students who, because of the high stakes nature, because they want to be here and it's sometimes really hard to be here, we have to try to bring our very best selves um, and our very best support around the edges so that they can, no matter what, get through the hard work of the classroom. Because if we can do that, they're going to come back. Um, and then we're not going to have all those challenges that are making headlines at other institutions. We're going to have a strong institution where we're all happy to come every day and our students feel like we're putting that path uh, in front of them. So enrollment, it matters. And what we do every minute of every day is the most essential input to, to making it work. I'll take questions, thoughts, reactions. And I'll turn over to Elise. Great. This is uh, 
This part of the deck is going to focus on the capital improvement program, which is also referred to as the CIP. And we do our capital projects planning, you know, three and four, and actually what we're doing now is even farther out because we know so much more than what we did a couple of years ago. And it's going to position us to make some requests of the General Assembly that the college actually hasn't made since um, building the Newport campus 14 years ago. Um, and I'm actually, I'm really excited about the work that's happened around this and um, our almost uh, ink dry um, facilities master plan. Because I think it really shows um, just, it, well, actually, why don't we go ahead and I'll tell you what I think it shows. <laughs> so uh, a lot of you um, were involved with um, the development of our last strategic plan. Um, we have the goals of enhancing student success, expanding partnerships and programs and strengthening institutional effectiveness. And my, what I would put to you is that this work uh, supports all three of those goals. Um, we took, uh, we had a wonderful consultant who really under, got to know the college well, spent several months kind of learning our facilities and learning our college, but also um, as we were wrapping up the strategic plan, talking with us about how this facilities master plan was going to support those goals and he's very personally kind of driven to do that and I think that what we've ended up with really reflects that. Um, we then took this facilities master plan and developed a capital improvement plan. Um, so that's the strategic investment in our facilities um, in order to support our overall goals that we have here. Um, I would I would pose to you that I, I've said that the ink isn't quite dry on the master plan, but we're already using it for the capital improvement program. It's because what, what we heard from all of you across all the campuses was really, really consistent. And so it really put, put us in a place that we could start to get going on several things. So we need to make a case for why CCRI needs this investment from the state. And we have a really, really good one. <laughs> Um, we serve over 42,000 people a year, and they are almost all Rhode Islanders. And frankly, whether you're a student coming um, because you're taking a driver's ed class, we should, uh, that should be the moment that we start recruiting you to come to, to, go, to go to college at the school or to get a credential to move forward with us. Um, we also know that our facilities, it, we've had deferred maintenance for nearly the entire time that the college has been um, here. And so we need to start addressing that. And some of that's not, um, it's not the, the shiny new objects. A lot of times it's things like HVAC systems, pipes, electrical, but it costs money and we need to make an investment there as well as um, in developing facilities that support effective teaching and learning. So there are, there's research that demonstrates that the environment in which you are learning has an effect on your, your, your um, persistence through school and your success in school. And that's true whether you're in kindergarten or you're in college, a two or four year college. Um, and our students deserve that, our faculty and staff to deserve, deserve to work and teach in places that reflect that. There's actually something that's not on here that's of critical importance. So we looked at the past 10 years of um, investment in higher ed education, capital investment in higher education, and CCRI historically has gotten between 9 and 13% of the money every year. That means the rest of the money is going to URI and RIC. Um, so that's a stunning figure, really, um, given what we just talked about. But the other piece of it is, in terms of bond dollars, we've gotten 2% over the past 20 years. Again, that means that all the other bond do do dollars are going to rick into URI. Um, so that's a pretty compelling case. Um, but the, here's the thing about uh, you know, capital improvement dollars and bond dollars. You don't get them unless you ask for them. No one's going to come knocking on the door and say, how much do you need? for that pipe and electrical work. You have to go and make a case and ask, and that's what we're gonna do. We were talking a little bit about how some things are underway already, and I just wanted to capture um, kind of some of the big ones. Um, I know that here, you're, we're gonna ask um, everyone here to really engage in how we're thinking about the redesign of the commons. Um, the architect is putting some concepts to put forward to you. 
Um, so that's going to be a focus of you know the first quarter of next year. Um, in Liston, uh, we do we've we've ordered the second elevator, I believe, <laughs> um, which will be really wonderful for uh, the members of our community who enter through kind of where uh, workforce partnerships offices. Uh, at, so they won't have to come all the way in to, um, to the atrium. And we're redesigning the atrium. So the comments in the atrium, what did, we, what did we find out that when we redid the Great Hall, people really like it. And they, I mean, when I'm, I'm stunned actually by kind of just the incredible use that that space is getting in a really kind of whether, you know, it's students playing ping pong or a group of students studying together or someone from advising and counseling meeting with a student there. It's, um, it's become a, such a center for that campus. And you want to know something? Our other campuses deserve that too. So we're, we're getting going on that. So same thing for Liston first quarter. Um, the architects is going to be coming out asking people to engage with them. That's going to look, uh, that will look like a presentation kind of meeting thing. But they're also going to do pop-up tables in the atrium and in the commons. So. Um, please take advantage and encourage people to go to find out what, what, what's being talked about, to give feedback on it, because um, it's a great opportunity for us to continue to figure out how our spaces build community on our campuses. The night campus, well, we've got the entry ramp. I'm so excited about how it's going to look when uh, we get to walk up our ramp, see the college police there in that great kiosk, and then walk down to the great hall, because it's excuse me, because it's going to be consistent. And not only that, the ramp will be enclosed, it'll be warm, much more welcoming than what we have right now. And I think really changes kind of the nature of walking into, into that building for the 6,000 people that come there every day. We've done our chemistry and biology labs at the Knight campus. Next up is physics and engineering. Um, which is part of our commitment to continue to look at our um, t teaching spaces throughout um, the college. And the student services redesign is also underway. So you're, you're, there are a lot of things that are in design and, um, and going to be unfolding. Um, this is a really exciting way to rethink about how a student experiences our student services functions. And I mean that so we're the if you think about um, well think about an Apple store so you there you you can do self-help there you can make an appointment to meet with someone that there's all different um, kind of different layers of the space so if you're talking about financial aid there's a level of privacy that maybe you don't need to have if you need to talk to the bursar or something like that maybe that's not the best example but <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think you you can get a sense of what it's going to look like so it's it's going the Warwick student services will look dramatically different. Um, I will say that one of the things about having all of this work going on at the same time is uh, we are going to need people to be flexible. It will the student services construction is going to take probably two years, which means that that whole function in Warwick needs a different home. And um, so, in what we're going to do is we're going to move athletics up here, wholly. And then we're going to look at the field house in Warwick and do some build out of it so Sarah and her teams can um, use that space for a chunk of time. Uh, we're very challenged in the college by not having kind of that flex space. And if we are successful in getting some bond money, we're only going to need to continue to have flex space. So, um, but it's very, it's a really exciting project. We're working closely. Um, with Kevin Salisbury and Michael Cunningham on kind of what that move is going to look like and it's likely to start in June with Sarah's team then moving into the field house around this time last, next year. Yeah. So in, the, and in Newport uh, we're replacing the roof. I think those of you that spend time there know that that's the roof has been an issue and we're replacing the chiller. So we, those are both you know kind of very, super practical but um, if you've seen how the, what's been happening with the roof in Newport, it actually does have an impact on the teaching spaces there. And then finally, across all campuses, we're doing cabling and infrastructure, um, technical infrastructure, to really big projects. And then we're going to continue to do ADA improvements. We have to, and it's the right thing to do. And as we 
have done things in different campuses. We've been getting great feedback from um, in terms of improving the accessibility of our campuses. So here is the major projects pending funding. And um, so what this means is we've, we constructed based on all of this work a request of just under $63 million that has gone to um, the governor's office as part of our FY21 um, budget. We have gotten clear indication that, uh, well, it's more, I can tell you the numbers. Um, the state has about um, 175 to $200 million available um, in terms of debt, and they've gotten $800 million of requests from different state agencies. Uh, so uh, difficult decisions will need to be made. We're gonna continue to press our case for money, and um, I, th I think one of the, we need to guys think about um, if you have had a chance to vote on these bonds, you know, you or I or Rick go and they say, we need a new residence hall, and it's a very specific thing, you know, or we need a new um, science center, very specific thing. We have some specific projects within our buildings, um, but we also have requests in for that deferred maintenance money that um, I was talking about, because that is where we have a huge need. So, for example, of that 62, 63 million, 30 million of that is, was for deferred maintenance projects. Um, so we've been responsive when asked to relook at the scope of the bond request that we've made, and you know, we're just gonna have to keep pushing for it. And, and I guess I should also just say, you know, we're not planning on stopping for asking for a bond in 2020. We've put it out to the council, 2022, 2024, 2026. So bonds are always on election year um, cycles, so and every two years. So just that's why the timing is such. So we have student services renovation phase two. This isn't actually gonna be a phase project. Um, I would say that we're kind of looking for the funding to get it done. I'm looking over at Kristen. <laughs> um, we're having a meeting about that tomorrow. Um, so what we want to then do is take what we've learned in the student services um, redesign in night and bring it here and ha then work with all of you about how to design a space here that is responsive and ac accomplishes the same goals of being welcoming, uh, you know, a, an a enjoyable place to work, uh, everything that we think that we can do in Warwick. Classroom and library upgrades. We're gonna keep putting money towards that. We know that we need to, um, the master plan talks about it pretty significantly because we do have, um, you know, we don't have the technology in our classrooms and in our labs. I mean, I, uh, you know, I'm, I, am, I am struck like when I look at the labs that haven't been renovated yet and they, they do look like the lab that I used when I was in high school. <laughs> um, so again, classroom technology and then that core building infrastructure upgrades, again, that's, that's the meat and potatoes of what it takes to run an effect, uh, um, efficient building. Um, oh, that was it. Um, okay. So I guess here's what I'm going to say, is that um, we will be communicating and know over time as the conversations go on with the governor's office. So the bond has to be part of what the governor proposes, and then it goes to the General Assembly. Um, I would say in terms of uh, this award that we ha were able to announce, that's a pretty compelling outside validator for all the hard work that everyone here has been engaged in. And that's gonna help us tell our story about why they should be paying attention to the investment that they're making in our college, both on the operating side, but also on the capital side. So we'll stay tuned because if we have something on the ballot for next November, we're gonna need everyone's help. We need you talking to all your families and friends. You need to register people to vote and they need to go vote for the bond. So um, I'm really hoping that we're gonna have a lot of conversation next fall about how we're gonna mobilize our, our, um, our team here uh, to go out and get that bond passed. Thank you all so much for coming. Really appreciate it. Happy, happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone.